Well, and something's changed your life. You begin to talk about it. Now, I, lest you think that he's, uh, he's a complete idolater, and uh, he's only a partial idolater, I, you know, like the rest of us. He is a, he's an amazingly go godly young man who just, uh, whose, whose, whose life and whose ministry just stagger me. I just am so, so proud of him. But you know, it does change your life. I remember the time, and many of you do too, when Jesus became more than a word to me. I was a freshman in college, and I'd grown up in the church, and I'd had all that kind of background. Growing up as a Lutheran, had done all the, the Lutheran stuff, had gone through years of catechism, had memorized all of Luther's small catechism, the whole thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so I knew all this stuff, but yet it had never really taken root in my life. And as a college freshman, I went to college thinking, okay, I'm going to finally reinvent my life. I didn't really like the way my life was going. I tried to figure it out in high school, and I couldn't figure it out, and I thought, now is my chance. I'm going away to college. I can start over again. And I went away to college, and the first week I had a, a revelation. My revelation was, maybe this isn't going to work the way I thought it was going to work, because I took myself with me. And by God's grace and providence, during fraternity rush of all places, my fraternity rush date, who, was a, who was, had been the president, who was the president of the sophomore class and was sort of a big man on campus and so forth, my fraternity rush date, his name, uh, whose name was Sonny Westbrook, took me out on the backyard of the Phi Delta Theta house and at, at Whitman College and sat me down and while everybody else was playing volleyball he shared with me about his love for Jesus and I had never heard another peer whom I trusted who I admired and I only admired this guy because of the fact that he had a reputation that was admirable I had never heard a peer whom I admired talk that way about faith in Jesus Christ and God did something in my life that afternoon and I walked back to my residence hall and walked into my room and I thought my life is never going to be the same after today and it wasn't and my poor roommate who I'll tell you about in a few minutes my poor roommate whose name was Alan thought what in the world has happened and what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Poor Alan. There's often such a gap, you see, between what we say and what we are living into on a daily basis that we sometimes aren't excited about our faith anymore. Instead of being an infomercial, you know, we just push the silent button, the mute button. Or we don't really believe that God will work in someone else's life the way that God has worked in our lives. Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit is still alive and well and at work in people's lives all the time? You know, we as Presbyterians have so domesticated God. You know, we don't like the wild, breaking loose, passionate kind of God. We don't like talking about even the Holy Spirit. We don't like that. We're more intellectual. We like the intellectual God, the sedate God, the Presbyterian God, the philosophical God, the one who's transcendent and imminent and, you know, trans whatevers, and, but doesn't come too close. That We can kind of define, put in a box. We don't want God to do anything unseemly, out of sorts. We, want, we don't want God to ask us to do something that might be tricky or hard or embarrassing. You know, last week, oh my gosh, did I ever get stabbed, you know, sometimes God just pokes me in the ribs, you know what that's like? You know? But sometimes God stabs me, I mean, just really, really pokes me. And I was, uh, I was reading uh, uh, Luke 18, it's the parable of the unjust judge, it's 
It's about, well, I won't tell you what the parable is about. I mean, the, a parable is really interesting in itself. And I was, I was actually looking at this parable because I was, getting, I was preparing to do a talk on prayer. But Jesus con con concludes the parable with this phrase, and I just got poked by it. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, when the Son of Man comes and returns to the earth, will he fa find faith? When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? It's a question that Jesus actually frequently asked in his ministry. He frequently characterized the disciples. I always wonder what they thought about it when he did it. He complete, his sort of little... Uh, uh, his sort of little pet name for the disciples were you little face and I you know I always think of Jesus sort of smiling and you know with that sort of gracious kind of way but you know saying oh you little face you little face you little face why because most of us don't believe that God will act we don't really believe that God will change people that God will show up that God will heal and forgive and love others the way that God has loved us. How big is your God? How big did God look to the first Christians, those in the book of Acts, whose lives were absolutely dumped upside down because of God's work? The good news must be personal. And that means hanging around where God is at work. Oh, my goodness. I wish you could have been at our Easter service at our, little sur uh, at our little church last Sunday. Since I was with you last, our church has more than doubled in size. And uh, we're still a little church, but we're getting bigger all the time. And it's an amazing thing. But on Easter, it was just amazing. A woman by the name of Karen stood up to talk about what God had done in her life in the last year. What God had done in her life. She... She lost her father when she was really young, when she was, I think, about eight or nine. Her father was killed in a very tragic accident. Her mother has been a lifelong alcoholic, and the alcoholism only got worse. And Karen grew up in this environment, and it was a very difficult environment, and, and uh, she spent her teenage years trying to find love in all the wrong places. When she went off to college, it didn't quit, and... Uh, she had a brush with um, alcoholism herself. It was a real struggle. She kept sort of wavering along the way. Her, other, her older brother, who was, had kind of held the, the, the family together in, in the absence of the father and in the presence of this alcoholic mother, had done what he could. And, and, um, but uh, a year before last Easter, Karen found herself pregnant and unwed by a man that she did not love and who did not love her. And it was a terrible thing. And when she told the family, the family thought it was a terrible thing. And people gave her all kinds of advice about what she was going to do. And as far as Karen was concerned, life was ruined. And in the middle of all of that, in the middle of all of that, for her, in her despair she wondered she just wondered that was all it was it was just enough to wonder whether God could actually redeem even this and she came to our church and our church embraced her and welcomed her in and ultimately she had the baby and our church walked with her as in the chapel, not of our church, but of, of, uh, of an adopt, the adoptive parents' church. They had a service. We had a service where she handed the baby to these adoptive parents. And Karen continued to grow. And last Easter, with great confidence, this timid, broken woman stood before our congregation and said, I know. Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive in me. And Jesus has changed my life. And this fall, Karen is in seminary.
The second thing we th look at from looked at in the book of Acts is the, the good news. The good news will look good only if it is credible. The good news will look good only if it's credible. When others look at us, what do they see? John chapter 13, Jesus says to his disciples, now I want you guys to learn to serve and to love one another. That's really important. In fact, Jesus says in John 13, verse 34, you will know my disciples. You will know my disciples by how they love one another. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another, and by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Because you love one another. That's how it works. Wow. Amazing. Real love. Loving people who aren't perfect, who aren't full of joy, who aren't full of hope and life, who sometimes think the most unfortunate things. but figuring out what it means to really love one another. And ultimately, then, we discover that this real love is the environment in which people begin to grow, an environment in which people begin to develop, in which they see Jesus, in which they begin to understand what it means to have more joy and more hope and more life with a capital L, a fellowship where even death doesn't do them in. I lost both my parents this last year. And it was such an, uh, an amazing thing. It was so hard. I mean, my father's death in some ways, I mean, these are people who were full of the Lord and full of years. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a happy thing, but it's a terrible thing to lose people that you love. My father, we were sort of prepared. And then when my mom died nine months to the day later, and my father at the end of November, um, it was a shock. She was healthy as a horse expected her to live past a hundred and it was a bleak bleak day when just the five of us my brother and sister and our couple of our spouses stood beside her casket on this snowy day in November in Walla Walla Washington with just the five of us standing there with snow all around and the bleakness and the headstone that had my father's name and my mother's name and just waiting for the date when she would, she would die, standing there. And I put my hand on the casket and I was just filled with grief and sadness. And then our pastor, their pastor, stood up and said, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We're here today to commit Jeanette's mortal remains to the ground. But she is not here. And suddenly, you see, there was something that welled up inside of me. And I was again filled with joy and hope. That's what the gospel does where people walk the walk, others do pay attention, whether you think they do or not. Let me take you back to Alan. I told you some of you this story last year, but I'm gonna tell it again because it's a really great story. My roommate, Alan, who, who, uh, who, who couldn't believe what happened to my life as a college freshman, who, who baited me, who teased me, who, I mean, some would say persecuted me, but I didn't, you know, I didn't feel particularly persecuted. I just felt sort of misunderstood. <laughs> but, uh, but he teased me. He called me the God Squad. He did all kinds of stuff. And, you know, he would always he would mock the stuff that I did and all of those kinds of things. He did it for the whole year. And uh, I lived with him the whole year. He was a good enough roommate. He was just not very nice about the things that had changed my life. And I just couldn't quit talking about it. 